welcome everybody um, to our uh, youth sport lecture series. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Travis Dorsch, who's an associate professor and the founding director of the Families and Sport Lab in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at Utah State University. Dr. Dorsch's research interests target the persons, that is parents, siblings, peers, and coaches, and other types of contexts, such as organizations, communities, and societies that have the potential to influence or be influenced by their athletes' behaviors, attitudes, experiences, and outcomes. His research has been funded by multiple national organizations, including the NCAA, the Aspen Institute, and Team SNAP. Dr. Dorsch has authored more than 50 uh, peer reviewed articles, book chapters, and national, um, I'm sorry, technical reports, and has contributed over 100 presentations across local, state, regional, and national and international audiences. His research findings uh, have been highlighted in outlets such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Time Magazine. And they're also used by sport governing bodies within the US Olympic movement, rec and elite youth sport organizations, as well as sport coaches and parents to hopefully build more developmentally appropriate sport contexts and to evaluate the role of youth sport in contemporary society. Dr. Dorsch is a member of the National Science Board for the President's Council on Sport, Fitness, and Nutrition, a research fellow of the U.S. Center for Mental Health and Sport, and a member of the steering committee for the Utah Olympic Legacy Foundation Sport 2030 Initiative. He was also named the 2021 Early Career Distinguished Scholar by the North American Society for the Psychology of Sport and Physical Activity. It is my pleasure to uh, warmly welcome Dr. Dorsch. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, that was that was a mouthful. You managed your way through it, and it was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, and, and very excited to be here with your audience tonight. Um, I, I'd like to to share this this forty five minutes or fifty minutes together and talk about a project that's been ongoing with some great colleagues of mine over the past couple of years, and we were commissioned by the USOPC, the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, to create a framework for quality parenting. Um, in all the youth sports that would fall under the umbrella of that larger organization. So tonight I'd like to take our time to share with you some cornerstones of that quality parenting framework and how they apply in the American youth sport ecosystem. So first and foremost, I think it's really important to understand what the youth sports system is or the ecosystem as, as I've described it on the, on the title slide there. And what you see here are a lot of gears and arrows and words and I don't want you to get lost in the minutia, but I want, what I want you to initially think about is that athlete there at the center of the model in red, that every athlete who participates in youth sports is somehow surrounded by people and by contexts that both influence and are influenced by their involvement, right? So if you think about your own experiences, whether you've been a coach, an athlete yourself, probably um, a, a parent of an athlete, maybe you've been the sibling of, a, of an elite or recreational athlete, all of these roles come with certain expectations and some with, come with certain opportunities, uh, again, to influence or be influenced by that athlete's experiences. And then more broadly, if you think about this top half of the model, there are organizations and communities and societal influences that have this sort of top-down influence, but are also in, in some small ways influenced by all of those people at the lower levels of the model. And then across the bottom, just to orient you, that black horizontal arrow at the bottom of the model speaks to the developmental nature of youth sport and the fact that, look, sport looks very different for, for young people in toddlerhood, in early childhood, late childhood, on through adolescence, and if they're fortunate enough, on into early and middle adulthood. So all of this together speaks to this idea that a, there, are, there are feedback loops, that when one thing happens, when a butterfly flaps its wings in one aspect of youth sport, it impacts other people and other uh, contexts, organizations, communities, and the society around them. So this is sort of our uh, how we're going to situate ourselves for the talk today as we try and understand the nature of the American youth sport ecosystem. Now, this model that, that I've just presented on for the past minute or so is derived from a Dorsch et al. paper that was published in 2020. And I had a number of great colleagues that worked on this paper. You'll recognize many of the names of these folks. And if you'd like to dig into the actual science, the actual conceptual paper that was published, uh, feel free to jump on this QR code right here with your cell phones, uh, and I'll make sure and provide these slides um, to Dr. Della Paoli at the conclusion of our talk today as well. 
Okay, so with the understanding that this is the model that we're going to work from, kind of our conceptual base, if you will, I'd like to take a moment, just a brief moment, to define what organizations, parents, and athletes are. And the reason I choose this is because this is sort of the crux of our talk today. Many of you work for sport organizations, either at the local community or maybe even regional or national level. Many of you also are youth sport parents or work with parents in, in the context of youth sport. And of course, our central focus within the entire model is the athlete. So I highlight those individuals in yellow, blue, and red here. And we define organizations as those groups or entities that administer, really it's the design and the delivery, right? They administer um, individual and team athletic opportunities. So this could be opportunities surrounding play, training, competition, anything that you would broadly define as sport, physical activity or exercise engagement that's structured. Parents we define as the biological, adoptive or otherwise regular caregivers of a child. So we know that this can include uh, right, biological parents, mothers and fathers. It can also include step parents, aunts, uncles, godparents, foster parents, grandparents, really anybody uh, who is a regular caregiver of that child in the sport context. And then we define athletes as the young people who participate in these organized sport contexts across the full range of participatory, developmental, and competitive Team USA sport context. So again, everything that would fall under the umbrella of the United States uh, Olympic and Paralympic Committee. And there are 56 NGBs and NGOs that fall under that broad umbrella. So really, <laughs> this model applies to most of the people in the United States who either are or have been athletes, are or have been parents, right? The siblings of those, those athletes, their peers, competitors, teammates, their coaches, the people who run the organizations, the community leaders, and more broadly, everybody in society who's interested in youth sports. Okay, with this as a launching point, I wanna jump into some primary reasons why young people participate in sports. And really, over the course of the literature in this area, this, this has been a question we've been asking now for about two or three generations, really since the 70s and early 80s. Why do young people participate in organized youth sport? And there's really three primary reasons. The first is to develop and demonstrate physical competence, right? We all want to be good at what we do. I want to be, I want to give a great lecture today, right? Dr. Delapioli wants to be a great instructor and professor for his students. We all want to be good at what we do. And young athletes are no different, right? It feels good to execute things and do them well, especially when we've been training to master a certain skill set associated with our sport. The second reason young athletes participate is to attain approval and acceptance from their peers, uh, excuse me, from, from adults and from their peers. So adults could be coaches, adults could be their parents, uh, peers could be, again, teammates, competitors, but it feels good to participate, to be accepted by these friends, these competitors, uh, frenemies in some cases in sports, but to identify as part of a larger whole, whether that's within our team or within a sport community or within a community in general, right? To put on that uniform and feel like we're part of something that we're pulling the rope in the same direction as other people or pulling against other people on the other side of the rope, right? We want to do it in a way that we can seek approval and acceptance from all those significant others in our world. And the third people, that, the, the third reason that young people participate is because they want to enjoy their experiences, right? Oftentimes, colloquially, we hear this um, referenced as they just want to have fun, right? And, and I don't necessarily like the word fun because I think it has a different sort of visceral component to it than actual enjoyment. We can enjoy things that are hard. We can enjoy things that are difficult and that challenge, challenge us, even maybe when they're not fun. But it feels good to engage in these things that foster enjoyment, a sense of choice, a sense of volition, a sense of pride in being able to accomplish somebody. So again, young athletes are participating to demonstrate physical competence, to attain approval from adults and peers, and ultimately to enjoy their experiences. Now, if we know that these are young people's goals, I ask you guys, most of, most of whom in the audience are likely adults, to reflect and introspect for a moment about what your goals are for young people in sports. If you have a child in sports, or if you're a coach and you have athletes that play for you, what are your goals for them? And do they align, which is going to be a word we come back to, do they align with the goals that you see here? Okay, so with the understanding that these are the three primary reasons that young people participate in sports, how and why and when and where do parents get involved? Let's look at that for a moment. There's really, again, three, three ways that parents are most involved in the sport participation of their young people. 
First and foremost, and especially at the earliest ages, parents are the providers of those, those experiences. I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, and, and they didn't come home when they were two and three and say, hey, dad, sign me up for soccer, right? It was, it was Bree, my wife, and I, and we, we found opportunities in the community, and we were the ones who then offered that as an opportunity to them. We were the provider or the gatekeeper to that initial experience, right? We enabled them to play some sports. We may have discouraged or not even brought up the opportunity to play other sports, right? This can include registering for lessons, for teams, transporting them to their training, to their competitions, to their practices, purchasing equipment, bringing snacks, attending events, laundering, right? All of these roles that you think about um, sport parents as taking on, we are the providers of those experiences for our young people. The second way that parents are involved is as role models in sport and physical activity settings. It's no coincidence oftentimes that young people get pushed into the sports that their parents either did or do or love. Right. We are role models. You see here a picture of a mom. Uh, you know, I'm assuming here it's a mom playing soccer with what looks like her two children. Right. Being in the yard, being active. My two kids, their mom, Bree, my wife, she's a competitive runner. She runs marathons. She does Ironmans. Our kids are now of the age where they see that happen and they say, oh, I want to do that, too. We just did a marathon together this fall and the kids did a little uh, one mile race beforehand because they wanted to be like mom. Okay, so we are role models. Parents are role models and coaches to a certain extent, too. But would we live active, healthy, engaged lifestyles from a physical activity, exercise, sport perspective? Our kids are more likely to want to do that, too. So a second key role is for us to be role models in the youth sports setting. And the third is that we are the interpreters of our children's outcomes, both good and bad, right? So our beliefs and our actions, everything we do on the sidelines, in the car, around the dinner table, conveys a message to our young people about what's important, how we define and determine success, okay? The appropriateness of certain activities based on gender or ability or age, okay? So think about those conversations, those daily conversations you have, or even the nonverbal um, sideline behavior, right? Your, your child does something on the, on, the, on the field and you put your arms back up around your chest like this and look the other way. What type of message does that convey to your athlete? When they do something on the field and you're cheering for them either to score or to pass or to steal the ball or to kill the opponent, all these things that you might be yelling from the sidelines, what type of message are you communicating about what's important in youth sport? So you're the provider of the experience, you're the role model, and you're the interpreter of that experience as well. And I know many of you in the audience, maybe even aren't parents, right? But your coaches or your sport practitioners or your league organizers or administrators. But thinking about these three things and how your parents that you may work with on your team or your club or in your community might be interacting with their young people, I think is a really important process of introspection to engage in. Okay, so ultimately what we're talking about here, I've just talked about a number of parent roles and a number of athlete goals. So the disconnect typically is how do those parent roles lead to athlete goals, okay? If we all, if we all can come to a consensus that we all want our young athletes to experience and achieve the goals that they set out to do, then we as adults, right? Again, the parents, coaches, the administrators, we should all engage parents in such a way that those roles lead to positive goals and outcomes for youth. So let's start on the back end of this equation and look at the goals that young people have in sport. Again, to develop and demonstrate competence, to attain approval, to enjoy those experiences. How then can we engage parents in such a way that they provide those experiences, that they act as role models, and that they interpret successfully their children's successes and failures? Now again, through a mechanistic or a procedural lens, our focus today is going to be on this, this arrow in the middle. How do we take the parent roles and deliver the goods when it comes to athletes' goals? And that's going to be the focus of the rest of the talk today. And that leads us really into this idea of a quality parenting framework, which, which I shared at the outset was something that was contracted by the US OPC that we've now taken. We're working with a number of NGBs from USA Ski and Snowboard to US Lacrosse and, and others, US Rowing. Um, and we're building out these quality parenting frameworks at an organization by organization level. And today I'd like to share with you a number of cornerstones or hallmarks of that parenting framework. And before I do so, I'd really like to acknowledge my co-authors on this project. Uh, of course, the work couldn't have been done without them. 
And the one thing you'll notice about this, this co-authorship team is the range of experiences. We have, we have medical doctors, we have doctors of orthopedics, um, we have PhDs, we have educational folks in here, we have uh, sports scientists, we have really the full gamut of folks who study and are interested in um, this, this, this context of organized youth sports. Now, again, some of these names uh, you, you've probably read before, you've probably read their work, if not directly, you've definitely been exposed to some of the work that they've produced over all of their illustrious careers. And I felt really fortunate to have led this team out on this project. In addition to this, even though the work was contracted by the US OPC, and it was very America centric, we did want to look at sort of a broader, we wanted to basically be able to call out some of our blind spots as Americans. We all know that our youth sports system is unique here in the United States. So we brought on a team of international consultants, five international consultants from Lithuania, the UK, uh, Brazil, Canada, and Australia. And those folks read through an initial version, uh, an initial iteration of this quality parenting framework and really provided some key feedback to help us contextualize our model. And if you recall, the model that I shared at the, at the outset today, at the top of that is societies. And within our society, there are certain traditions and values that we have that cross over with many other countries, but that are different from many other countries as well. So again, these folks helped us call out some of those blind spots and, and rethink and retool our initial draft of the document. In addition to that, when all was said and done, we shared a final version with four expert reviewers from here in the United States, uh, really with an opportunity. Th these folks have been in the field for a number of years and they were able to provide some, some what I'll call institutional knowledge around parenting and youth sport and around that, that uh, literature base. So they were again able to offer one final layer of context and understanding for our final document before we delivered it to USOPC. Now, the product uh, of, of this workflow was a 35 page document, again, that we delivered to USOPC and that now we are recrafting for many of their, their subsidiary NGBs and NGOs, as I mentioned. At the heart of all of this, though, was an idea that there is, uh, broadly speaking, a right way to parent. Now, that doesn't look the same across the developmental spectrum or for every family who has a child engaged in youth sport across the varying levels of youth sport. But there are some key concepts that we wanted to deliver that, that are sort of what we call always good concepts, right? Um, you can think of them as principles and, and practices. Um, I like to use the term principles. A lot, a lot of people say best practices, and I think that's maybe a bit too proscriptive. I like to use the term best principles, and I'll talk about why here in a little bit. But with these principles, we feel like parents and those who work with parents um, can put them on the right trajectory to affording the best opportunity for the young people to have a successful experience in organized youth sport. So what are the cornerstones? I've been promising uh, cornerstones and typically if a building is a square or a rectangle, there are four cornerstones. And uh, in that tradition, I'll share four cornerstones with you today of quality parenting in organized youth sports in the United States. So as we know, cornerstones are typically the first block that's laid. You can think all the way back to ancient Egypt, to Rome, to Greece, typically in these nice buildings that we talk about, um, that we see when we travel around the world, four cornerstones are the, the basic groundwork. Uh, they, they mark the location, they mark the orientation of a structure. And just in the same tradition, we wanted to use these four cornerstones to mark the location and the orientation of this quality parenting framework. And I'd like to share those four with you here today. So when we think about cornerstones, uh, oftentimes we, we come up with these nice little acronyms uh, that, that utilize uh, the same first letter, right? Think of it as alliteration uh, for youth sport parenting. Affordance, alignment, acceptance, and awareness. And I'm gonna share uh, more on each of these four with you here over the coming slides. Affordance, alignment, acceptance, and awareness. So affordance, as you might expect, is the, the provision to athletes from parents of these opportunities to explore, to innovate, to make decisions, right? Think about another, another A word, not to confuse you, autonomy, right? We want to give our young people the choice, the direction, the volition that, that sport is about them and that we are here as adults to support them rather than the other way around. So you can think of this as an autonomy supportive uh, communication style between parent and child. Asking them, let's say they're a rower, 
Are you excited to row again this season? How much training do you want to do? Which races would you like to compete in? You see, these questions, what they do is they center the focus on the athlete. It's not me as the parent saying, oh, hey, I signed you up for rowing. Or, oh, hey, you're going to train five nights a week and on weekends. Or, oh, hey, I signed you up for these four races. But there's an interactional, there's an exchange that's happening between parent and child where we communicate that we are here to afford you experiences, but that you get to dictate the extent to which you want to engage in those experiences. So again, autonomy supportive is the primary take home here. We are supporting the athlete in his or her decision making process. And we know from years and years of research that when we ask questions like this, and more specifically, when parents are rated by their child as being more autonomy supportive, that that builds their intrinsic motivation or their internal desire to want to participate. And when that intrinsic motivation is higher, young people have greater enjoyment, which we talked about as one of their goals earlier on. And then when enjoyment is higher, so too is their commitment to continue participating. Now that should resonate with many of you as coaches, as organizational leaders, as community leaders, because what's the one thing that you may want out of all of this? That's young people to come back, right? Young people to come back, to enjoy that experience and come back in subsequent seasons. So cornerstone one is affordance. We as parents need to afford opportunities for our children to explore, to innovate, to make their own decisions through autonomy, supportive engagement and communication. The second cornerstone is alignment, our second A, alignment. And by alignment, what I mean is that we need to align our expectations as parents to their athletes' desires, right? And then we need to make sure that that, that alignment with our athlete is on the same page as the coach and the club as well. And this creates a nifty little triangle here that you see at the bottom right of the screen. And that is we want alignment, okay? We want this to be circumspect between parents' expectations, athletes' desires, and the club and the coaches' needs. And when these three are in alignment, what we tend to see is more introspection taking place by, the, uh, by all three, okay? So, so coaches that are sitting down and reflecting on their coaching behaviors, parents that are doing the same and engaging with their athletes around their goals, desires, and needs. So introspective opportunities could be, hey, what goals do I have for my athlete in their sport, right? What goals do I have as a parent for my athlete in their sport? And then what goals does my child actually have? And here's the important one, this third one. How am I supporting one of these goal sets over the other? Hopefully it's the second over the first, right? But, but again, that period of introspection, that opportunity to say, hey, am I valuing my goals for my child over their actual goals for themselves? And then as, as the ultimate question, do our goals, our family goals, child and mine, do those align with the coach and the club? If the answer is no, then they're probably not in the right club with the right coach. Alternatively, it could be that you and your athlete are valuing something that the club doesn't necessarily value it, and you can reevaluate that relationship. Okay. So the second cornerstone, again, is alignment. We want to make sure that our expectations align with our athletes and that combined our family's expectations align with the coach and the club. Now, the third cornerstone, acceptance. Okay. We want to encourage our athletes to share openly and often about their sport experiences and outcomes. When our athletes share something, I think back to Simone Biles in the Summer Olympics and, and her um, experiences around mental health. There are a number of people in, in the media and you know all over social media, especially that, that shut her down and said, you're an Olympian, get over it. Are we accepting our athletes? And this becomes even more important, not just for Olympians, but for our young people, especially. Are we listening to them? Are we trying to understand and empathize with their sport experiences, good, bad, indifferent? and the outcomes that they experience in sport. We need to be more accepting and empathetic of our young people in sport because after all, it's their journey and we are there to support them. So how are we doing that, right? One way of doing that is to build safe context for communication, right? That could be the venue, right? Immediately after a competition or a training. It could be in the car on the way to or from. It could be around the kitchen table with the whole family and their siblings and their other, their, 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 their other parent, if there's a second parent in the household. So all of these contexts come into play. And as a parent, uh, or as you, as someone who's working with a parent, we want to build and structure these as safe environments for young people to share. And when I say safe environments, what do I mean? I mean, we need to listen actively. We need to demonstrate understanding and empathy by making eye contact, by having positive and engaged body language, by using a tone of voice that conveys 
uh, unconditional positive regard and care. We also want to be mindful uh, of, of how we're engaging, right? Again, I talked about the body language of crossed arms, about eye contact off into space rather than with the athlete. Often with young athletes, it's a parent who stands over them, all right, in a, in a sort of domineering fashion rather than getting down, kneeling down, sitting down, getting in chairs, sitting on the couch together and letting them know, look, we are in this together. There's so much that can happen from a communicative and, and a, and a non-communicative relational patterns um, that we really need to encourage our athletes to, to feel like they can share in that open and honest way. So again, acceptance becomes the third cornerstone of quality parenting. And the fourth and final cornerstone that I'll share today is awareness, right? And I think when, when we talk about awareness, um, we, we want parents to engage, absolutely, but we want them to engage purposefully and with care. And what that means is there needs to be some ground rules. And oftentimes I, I put the onus on this to the coach or the league or the administrator to help parents know how to engage purposefully, when to engage at all, and how to do so in a way that shows care both for the role of the athlete and the role of the coach and the broader ecosystem around that, that team or organization. So I, I like to laugh around this a little bit, but if you can't spot that parent, you probably are that parent, right? And I think one, one thing to keep in mind is that, that th this is how we learn, right? You go back way back to Bandura's work in psychology and we learn, we are social animals and we learn by watching others. And when others do something and get rewarded for it, we also want to do that. When others do something and look like a fool or get punished for it, we want to avoid doing that. So I encourage parents, uh, this, this is a saying that my dad gave me young in life, but I use it with parents all the time, that God gave you two eyes, two ears, and one mouth, and we should use them in that proportion. And I think for parents, that's really important as well, right? Watch, observe, listen. That's listen to your coach or to your child's coach, listen to your child, listen to other parents, listen to referees, listen to parents who have been there a little bit longer than you. Think about all that, take all that information in. And if still there's a need to engage the coach, do so with care in a respectful manner. A couple of questions that I ask parents to ask themselves is, am I providing or denying my athlete control and ownership over that, their own experience, right? Again, back to that idea of autonomy, that idea of wanting to feel good at what it is we're doing. Young athletes want to feel that. They want to take ownership and we need to give them those opportunities. Is the quality and quantity of my involvement allowing my athlete to thrive? Am I a snowplow parent getting rid of all the obstacles in front of them? Am I a helicopter parent hovering over them and watching everything they do and micromanaging the experience? Or can I sit back, be a supporter, and let my child engage in their sport process? So, so you as folks that are helping design and deliver youth sport context need to understand what parents do and when and why they do it to help them engage. Because look, they're going to engage regardless. So it's your job to help them engage in the most appropriate ways possible. And asking them to be introspective, I think, is a great start. Okay. So again, cornerstone four is to have parents uh, be aware by engaging purposefully and with care. Okay. I brought up this distinction earlier about principles and practices. And I want you to think of these, treat these cornerstones as principles, not practices. I am not giving parent X or parent Y proscriptive behaviors to engage in. What I'm doing is giving you these cornerstones as ways to think about how parenting can be most effective in organized youth sports. So again, these practices are kind of universal, one size fits all approach, whereas principles give tools to individuals, to the parents themselves, uh, to the athletes to help regulate that relationship, and then to you as coaches and administrators to help shape the context in which parent engagement occurs. So again, principles, over practices. Okay. And I will remind you the reason we utilize principles over practices is because there's not really one correct way to parent. I believe there to be a set of correct principles, but not one way to correctly parent young people that fosters all those wonderful things that we expect to be fostered through our young people's sport participation. Okay, so a few reminders. So you're probably asking me at this point in the, in the conversation, so what do I do? What do I take to my parents? What can I remind them to do if I'm having, let's say, a preseason meeting with parents in my league or on my team? Well, the first, and the, fir the first and foremost thing that I like to share with parents is that growth is not always linear. In fact, it's never 
linear, right? You wouldn't expect a young athlete to go from, let's say, U8 soccer in this first picture to a national team level in a straight line. There are going to be successes. There are going to be failures. And this is a famous meme that makes its way around on social media uh, around what people think success looks like, looks like and then what success actually looks like. And the thing about this is it's not just cliche. This is actually embedded in the American development model, uh, which of course started a number of years ago. USA Hockey brought this to the fore within the Olympic movement. And now the broader uh, Olympic movement has adopted this in the United States, but really across all the stages uh, of development from the youngest of young to Olympic and international level competition, coaches and organizational leaders need to understand that growth is not always linear. The second reminder is that sampling and specialization, two words that we hear a lot of these days, are not mutually exclusive. And to bear this point out, what I'd like to do is share an example from, from my life. This is my daughter, Josie. Um, this picture was taken last year. She's seven now. And she's a pretty elite young ski racer, as elite as a seven-year-old could be anyway. And the 111 at the bottom is how many days she had on snow either in sort of what you might consider free play, just skiing with, with friends or us as a family, all the way up through training and competition days on snow. So 100, 111 days on snow. If you looked at this absent of context, you might say, wow, Dr. Dorsch is really pushing that girl um, into specialization. She's too young for that. And I would say, but here's the rest of what she's doing throughout a traditional year. This was actually last year, I, I counted. Right, She had 16 days with her flag football team of, of practice and of games, 52 days with her hockey team, much of this during the winter at the same time that she was participating in skiing. Um, a couple of dozen days on the soccer field, um, dance studio. She did a learn to play track thing where she had a number of, um, she got to learn a number of events uh, in track and field. She played basketball, she did climbing. I'm probably missing some here. But the point of sharing all of this is that Oftentimes we tend to bifurcate sampling and specialization and one is good, sampling is good and specialization is bad. But what I'm here to tell you is that what we need is variety over the course of the season. What young people need is breaks over the course of a calendar year, okay? So sampling and specialization can coexist, particularly if a young person has um, an adequate skill set to progress faster in one sport than they might in others. I would never, have Josie participate in 111 days of skiing without the context of all the rest of this. That, I believe, would be bad for her. But in the context of all of the rest, I think it's okay to begin to specialize and focus on a primary sport so long as there are breaks and so long as there are other opportunities to play for other coaches, to play with other teammates, to play in other sport mediums, uh, ball sports, individual sports, speed sports, straight line sports, agility sports, all of these need to come together to form the foundation of what I'll call athleticism with a capital A, athleticism that ultimately whatever Josie decides to do, right, it'll probably not be skiing, right? There's only so many spots ultimately on an Olympic team. She might want to do something else. She might end up being better at something else. And that's great because we've laid for her a foundation. Okay, and again, with the American developmental model, this really aligns with stage three, which is when we begin to see this transition into more competitive and engagement, uh, engaged environments on the part of young people. The third reminder for parents is that parents are not always assistant coaches, but they should always be assistants to the coach, if that makes sense, right? So they're not wearing the hat and the polo, they're not on the sidelines, they're not an assistant coach, but they should always be assistants. They should always be helping the coach. And what that means is engaging children in free play opportunities, assisting them at home with goal setting, supporting their tactical and technical learning, right? Helping reiterate what the coaches are trying to teach them at training and competition, making those lessons that can be translated again in the car, around the dinner table, on the sidelines, right? Uh, modeling mindfulness, not losing our cool on the sidelines, prioritizing our personal assets. So what is the translation of skills learned in sport to skills that we can utilize in everyday life. And again, I mentioned all the roles that we take on um, as parents, right? We're, we're their nutritionist, we're their psychologist, we're their launderer, we're their chauffeur. We're doing all of this for our young people to have a great experience in youth sport. And most importantly, I think we want to acknowledge growth. Really push your parents to provide that positive stimulus to young people when they have little successes, celebrate those little successes. 
Okay, it's really, really important for their intrinsic motivation, which we know then leads to enjoyment and motivation to continue participating in future seasons. Uh, again, this aligns really nicely with the first three stages of the American development model. Uh, and, and this is something that the USOPC has put its trust in as far as how do we develop not just the best athletes, not just the podiums uh, in every quadrennial, but how do we get the, the young people to experience the most out of youth sports? And the final reminder for parents that I want to share is that sport is more fun when it's family. And this is not biological family. This is sport is more fun when we feel like one, when we feel like a family together on the sidelines, on the road trips, in the hotels, at trainings, right? So how do we do this? Well, we can think of this as something kind of abstract and far reaching and, and something that just has to develop. But I think there are actually ways that we can do this through positive daily interactions. If parents are having positive daily interactions with each other and with their children and with you as coaches and administrators, those positive interactions then lead to the building of quality relationships. And when quality relationships serve as a foundation for any team or club or cohesive group around a community sport context, then we feel that sense of community. We feel that sense of oneship, that sense of pulling that rope in the same direction. And when we feel that sense of community, it leads to enhanced experiences and outcomes. And this becomes then an iterative cycle, an iterative cycle where when you continue to add new people to the equation, right? Some people leave, some people come, the team is new each and every season, but we have now a culture of positive interactions to build quality relationships, to enhance a sense of community that leads to better experiences and outcomes for everyone involved, not just the athletes, but the parents, the coaches, the administrators as well. So treating sport like family sounds a bit cliche, but it's the absolute positive truth. And it all starts with daily positive interactions. So challenge yourself as a coach, challenge your athletes, and challenge the parents who are supporting those athletes to engage in positive interactions every time they're around the team. It will work magic for you, I promise. And again, this all aligns with the American developmental model, um, specifically the first three stages of that model, kind of pre-Uber competitive um, context. Okay, so let's wrap it up. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, in a minute, open the floor for some Q&A, but what I wanted to do is just remind you real quick of these four cornerstones of quality parenting um, in the US rowing ecosystem, okay? And I use US rowing because I shared an example earlier from the rowing ecosystem. I just gave a talk to US rowing and they're very interested in this. And, and, and like many other sports, like skiing, like um, uh, track and field, like swimming, rowing is kind of an individual and team sport, right? And when we think about this, how do we get parents involved and engaged in individual and team sport contexts? Again, it comes down to these four uh, cornerstones, affordance, alignment, acceptance, and awareness. Say them to yourself, say them often, journal on them, write on them, think about them, and introspect on them. And if you'd like to layer in some more context uh, to some of what we have here, uh, I've got another QR code at the bottom right of your screen, and you can learn more about parenting resources. Um, this is on our lab website, actually. We have a number of resources on the full spectrum of youth sport, all the way from the very beginning stages of learn to play, all the way up through Olympic and professional competition. I've really enjoyed my time with you today. I look forward to engaging in a little bit of Q&A here when we're done. And I do encourage you, um, if you'd like to reach out, my email is here below. We've also got our lab website and at the very bottom, uh, my Twitter handle. Uh, you can follow some of the work that we're producing and also some of our community engagements as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much and uh, look forward to connecting. Thank you so much, Travis. A um, lot of really useful info there. Um, for those that are attending, uh, you can use the chat function or raise your hand and I can unmute you to uh, ask the question. Um, but first and foremost, um, I wanna uh, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Hondo Diaz. Um, he's a uh, baseball coach for uh, teenage boys and I'm sure he has probably a few questions for you, Travis. Sure. Um, thank you, Travis, again, for coming um, tonight for the Sports Council. Um, so one of the things that, you know, kind of caught my attention was, again, the whole sports sampling versus, uh, versus specializing in sport. Um, so I hate to say, but like I coach at like um, a private organization or what some would consider an elite organization versus your recreational level. Um, however, you know, 
based off of what you're saying, I, like, I thought that was really cool how you counted the days for your daughter. Um, and I, I started to think about like in my career, um, like when I started to specialize in baseball, when I went to go play, you know, I played basketball in, in the YMCA. I went out and played tackle football or two hand touch, whatever with my buddies, you know, I wouldn't really consider that, you know, sport sampling because it's not an official league or it's not in, um, a school, like a school sport, you know, so for me, you know, I did, you know, specialize in baseball as a sophomore in high school. Um, now, however, you know, when I, when we went to um, Detroit a couple of years ago for the Aspen Institute, their project play, um, and they were talking a lot about that at the time, you know, for me, it was all about what was accounted for in terms of a, a rec sport or something that was organized. You know, it didn't just come from like, hey, do you even go out and play soccer at the, the local school or do you play basketball outside, you know, something like that. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, but for, to wrap that all up, my question would be, is there really an appropriate time to say, you know, okay, now's the time to start to specialize? Yeah, so if we look to theory here, Jean Cote and his colleagues um, at Queen's University in Canada have, have done a lot of research on this. And in their developmental model of sport participation, they talk about kind of that window between 14, 15, 16 as being an age where traditionally folks, uh, folks would begin to specialize. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, young people have now, for the most part, been through puberty and their bodies, we at least have an idea of what their bodies are going to be like as adults. Uh, they've also learned, okay, they've, they've had enough experience now in these other sports and they've learned sort of what, what do I like and what am I good at? So those are, those are three things that I think really matter, right? What do I like? What am I good at? And what will my body afford for me in terms of my athleticism, right? If I want to continue pursuing an elite pathway or trajectory, which usually specialization entails. So when we can answer those three questions, I think it's more developmentally appropriate to then uh, begin to decide and maybe set aside some other some other passions or some other things that we, maybe we'd like to do to, again, hone our focus into these one or maybe two primary sports. I'll share an experience, though, with you um, from this summer. And, and look, even athletes at the most elite level don't need to hang everything else up. There are a number of lessons to be learned and a number of ways to keep one's body sharp by doing sports or even in a free play setting that are different than your primary sport. So here's, here's the example I wanted to give. Um, I was in France this summer with, with Josie. She was doing a, a ski racing camp there for 12 days. And, um, and, and as you might expect, in summer glacier skiing, you're going to do the majority of your work in the morning, and then you get off the snow and get off the glacier and come back to the valley where it's very much summertime in the afternoon. And we see Olympic skiers out there, uh, World Cup skiers out there playing tennis, playing soccer, doing plyometric workouts, doing all kinds of stuff to simply keep their bodies moving. Right. And, and you could think of this at an elite level as sampling. It very much parallels the example you gave about when you chose to play baseball, you were still playing rec soccer and rec basketball and some of these other things. Even if it wasn't in an organized league, you were still doing all those things that kept your body fit and strong and agile. So I, I, I don't want folks to walk away with the idea that you have to be in leagues or on teams right, to be, quote unquote, sampling. I think you can you can definitely have a primary sport and be specializing, but still be engaged like Josie, like you like you described, still be engaged in other sport opportunities throughout the year. No, that, that makes total sense. And I think most people do that. Um, and, and I know, for example, in baseball, again, I, I always use that as my example. That's what I know the best. But, you know, you can't play baseball year round in most places because, you know, the strenuous throwing um, your arm is not built to throw a baseball. So if you're doing that for 12 months, you know, when you're 10, 11, 12, 13, by 15, that's why you're seeing so many arm injuries because of that, you know, but by giving yourself a chance in off seasons to do something different and use different muscles, you know, that was always the thing that I was told that will help my body actually when it came back to the season time. Yep. It's, it's, it's really important. And you're right on point. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I reflect on, and of course I, I considered it a privilege to be a, a four sport high school athlete. I, I was blessed to be able to do so, but it, it was more than that. It was an opportunity for me when, when basketball was over in the winter, I hung it up and I did track. And when track was over, I hung it up and I did baseball in the summer. And when baseball was over, I hung it up and I did football. And I, I was able to sort of compartmentalize these sports. And, and I say that acknowledging that, that not all people, you know, 
can necessarily do that and continue to move up the ladder, the competitive ladder, right? Some folks feel the need to really hone in on one or two sports year round. And that's absolutely their prerogative, especially as I mentioned, kind of in those post puberty years, when you really start to figure out what it is you want to pursue, what it is you're good at, but in an ideal world, right? Baseball is a great example. I'm glad you brought it up. In an ideal world, you'd be doing other things that force you to move your body in different ways, playing with different people for different coaches, if there is in fact a coach and learning all of those different lessons that then when you come back to your primary sport, whatever it might be, even if it's just two months off or three months off for a baseball player, that when you come back, now you can apply those lessons in that important context to you. So there are a number of pathways. And I acknowledge that, that one pathway is no better or worse than another. But what we do know from the literature is that when young people specialize too early, in other words, when they pick one sport um, and, and eliminate all other sporting opportunities in that pre-puberty window, that typically, typically we're either going to see overuse injuries or sort of more kind of psychosocial dimensions of, of burnout and staleness um, and, and dropout eventually, potentially. So, so yeah, we want to keep it fresh. We want to keep people moving their bodies and we want to do so in a developmentally appropriate way. Travis, we have a question from one of our um, attendees. Uh, with rec sports and travel teams where parents pay a lot more for travel teams, when you always have conflicting schedules, the parents will always make the decision to go to the travel games. How do you make the athletes who are only playing recreation games come to terms of fair playing time to the athletes who show up all the time for rec games compared to the players who show up uh, who show up for um, occasionally for rec versus travel games? That's a really, really good question. Thanks, thanks to the individual who asked it. Um, there, there's one problem there. And the problem I heard was, the parents will make the athlete go to the, the travel team, right? Um, I think if we look at this through a lens of like behavioral economics, yeah, we want some return on our investment. And when the investment is larger for the travel team, sure, we're going to go there. One thing that I've tried to do and not always succeeded at, uh, you know, I shared the, the, the pictures of Josie. And in the winter, when she's trying to balance skiing, hockey, and, and basketball, on Saturdays, all three of those have some sort of either training or competition. And, and so on Saturdays, we typically try and let her decide to give her a little bit of that autonomy. Now we kind of script the rest of the week based on, you know, where her brother is going to be, where we can get her, you know, where most of our resources are going. So typically it's into the skiing. Um, she'll get one night of hockey during the week. And then on Saturday, we either try and balance it all, or if there are conflicts, we, we actually ask her uh, what she wants to do. And, and sometimes in the short term that hurts. Cause I'm like, oh, but you got a ski race next weekend and you want to go to basketball. That's like the inner monologue as a parent. But then I have to take a step back and Brie and I talk and we're like, no, thinking about this long term, right. For her to continue to love skiing and love hockey and love basketball to the extent that when the time is right, she can make her own decision. We really have to let her learn to make her own decisions now. And, uh, and sure, that might mean missing a basketball game or missing a day on the hill or missing a hockey game, but these are the decisions that you have, you have to let happen, right? Because again, it goes back to that affordance that we talked about as one of those pillars, affording our young people the opportunity to make those decisions. Yeah, I guess um, to follow up there, maybe to be a, a bit more direct is, is how do you not only communicate that and maybe strategize with that, but how do you communicate? I think the question was, how do you communicate that to the rec players who yeah. are always playing rec and yeah. then, um, you know, uh, balancing that with maybe a bit more uh, competent players on, on the travel team. Like what, what would you communicate to athletes and, oh, and maybe man. communicate to kind of the team parents, yeah. uh, who, you know, it's not, it's pretty obvious because sometimes their, their children aren't there um, as right. maybe as a coach or an administrator, how would you, uh, yeah. That issue. No, thank you for following up. I'm sorry I missed that part of the question, but it's a re it's also a really good one. Um, and I'm conflicted by this because I've been on on both sides of it. I think ultimately I'll start with by saying I think it boils down to the coach's sort of philosophy and how you communicate that philosophy to parents and athletes at the beginning of the season. The most important thing is that you set ground rules so everybody knows what those ground rules are. And it might be that if you miss training, you're not going to play. Uh, and if that's the ground rule, that's the ground rule. It might be that you as a coach uh, value you know, varied experiences across the week and that you're going to play the players in competitions, you know, sort of sort of based on whatever your philosophy is. 
and let me share another experience with you because my wife, my wife, I won't go so far as to say she berates me, but she makes fun of me um, because she was a track athlete and ended up going to run track in college. Um, I also ran track in high school, but I was more of a baseball player. Baseball was my passion. So I would show up for track meets without having trained during the week. And I would run the 400. I would triple jump. I would do whatever I could to score points for, for the track team. But I was a baseball player. So I was always at baseball practice during the week. And Bree said, man, that would have been terrible to have been on, you know, been your teammate because I would be the one out there working hard. And then you show up and you get to run, you know, the open four and you get to do the triple jump and all of that. So I see both sides of it. I really, really do. So it comes down to, for coaches, for league administrators, what you value, right? Do you value equal experiences for all of the players? Do you value a varied youth sport experience where, yes, sometimes kids are going to miss training um, and sometimes they're going to show up and have not been there during the week? What it is that you value and then communicating that at the top of the season to those parents. And then whatever those ground rules are, they have to live with. And you need to maintain consistency in how you apply um, those ground rules. But that's the best I can give you because I really do. I come at this from a do as much as you can, as much as you're capable of, um, and that the, everything else will sort of weed itself out. But I definitely see the perspective of that other athlete or other parent who feel wronged because their kid's there working hard and then another kid comes in and plays either equally or even more in some cases than, than your child. Yeah, thanks, Travis. I, I think you, you raised a really good point about um, setting expectations. And one thing uh, here at Rutgers that we try to do with our uh, safety course is really emphasize coaches holding that kind of parent meeting at the beginning of the season. If you're a first time coach, which most of our coaches are that go through our program. Um, I guess my question to you, and this is probably gonna be the final question of the night is. Um, how did it start communicating some of these ideas from the parenting framework you shared potentially into that beginning of the season uh, parent and athlete or parent expectation meeting that the coach uh, should hold? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a really, a really good question, Anthony. Um, you know, you can start with those four cornerstones and maybe you don't even want to use those words. Maybe you want to make it more accessible, more you more aligned to your philosophy as a coach or as an admin or a league, you know, league admin. Um, but reflecting on those four cornerstones that I shared and then some of the underlying lessons and then also some of those, um, those four key take-homes that I left for parents um, at the end of the talk, you know, structuring, um, structuring a talk for parents is never easy, but I think you need to be first and foremost authentic. That's the most important thing. True to your guiding philosophy asking yourself as a coach or as an administrator, why did you get into sports? And the answer to that question should guide all of the goals that you have as a coach for your athletes and for, uh, for parent engagement. Once you've gone through that introspective process um, and, and can really own what it is that you want your athletes to get out of the experience, then you can start to think about, okay, how can parents help facilitate that? Because look, I think I mentioned this in passing during the talk, parents are gonna be engaged. They're going to be there on the fence or on the on the glass or on the side of the ski slopes, whatever it might be. They're going to be there watching you, critiquing you, watching their kids. And, and you know what? As much as you can do as a coach, no matter what you do, you're going to have to send those kids home with those parents. They live with them in most cases. So they're going to have to get in that van, get in that suburban and drive home with them and eat dinner around the table with them and wake up and, and listen to them at the breakfast counter. So to the extent that you can help shape the parents in a positive way, bring them into your culture, bring them into your philosophy, get ownership and buy-in from them, makes your task exponentially easier. So, so I love the idea, Anthony, that you shared about these preseason meetings, but it can't just be a 10 commandments or a, here's a contract, sign it type meeting. It needs to be authentic. It needs to be guided by your vision and philosophy as a coach. The parents need to know the why, the why did you get into coaching and what it is that you want to accomplish. And I think when all of that can happen, then you're going to have advocates on the sidelines rather than antagonists. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to formally thank you uh, for just a, a wonderful talk and um, great advice too. And, and we had some good questions bounced back and forth. Um, this concludes our uh, first ever uh, youth sport uh, lecture series. And so thank you, Dr. Dorsch, and thank you uh, all for attending um, have a great rest of your week and enjoy.